All right. So, today we are going to start with Psalm 82, which is the last of the Psalms that we are going to cover that are considered non messianic. And for some reason, the clicker is not working. There we go. Psalm 82, Rescue the Week. Who's got the first? Actually, this is the whole psalm. Who's got Psalm 82 first? All right, God summons the judges. Who are the gods referring to here? God has taken his place in the divine council in the midst of the gods. What are you talking about? Rulers? Okay. Any other thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it could be. Um, The word here in this text, the Hebrew word for gods is Elohim, which we should recognize as being the Hebrew word for God. It's often used to talk about God, especially in the Trinity. Um, It is sometimes used to talk about angels, and it's sometimes used to talk about um, judges or men who receive the word. I think what we're going to find as we go through this psalm here is that in this case, it is referring to the judges of Israel, the, the, the representatives of God in Israel the ones who received his word, he is coming to take place in divine counsel and stand in the midst of those judges to hold judgment against them. So again, he's standing in their midst and he demands justice for the needy and he exposes their weakness. Um, And then it says in in verse 5, they have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All of the foundations of the earth are what does that mean? What does foundations refer to? Because what we find here is that God is coming down to judge his representatives among his people, and he finds them lacking. He finds them um, you know, lacking in terms of how they treat the weak and the fatherless. That they, don't, they don't stand for justice. And so the foundations of the earth are shaken. What does that mean, foundations? nation okay that that makes sense any other thoughts i think here uh, foundation really is referring to like the the premise that everything was built on right god created this world um, for a purpose and he created man to have a relationship with man and he put judges in place with his people for a very specific reason to guide the people in their relationship with And in shirking their responsibilities in, um, you know, uh, in the fact that they were unjust, specifically to the weak and the fatherless and the afflicted and the destitute, that is shaking the foundation upon which everything was created. And and to Scott's points, the foundation upon which their, their nation was founded, right? So it's shaking the very foundation of the relationship with the Creator. So... God sentences the judges. Uh, He has called them his children, but they will die like everyone else. So my question here is, what is Asaph 
asking for in verse 8 when he says, Rise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. He's asking, for, he's asking for righteous judgment. He's asking for God to come down and pass righteous judgment on the nation. And that's something that we ought to really want God to do for ourselves, right? We ought, we ought to want God to righteously judge us and to discipline us and keep us on the straight and narrow. Otherwise, the foundation of our lives will be shaken. Just like it says the foundations of earth are shaken. It's a scary thing to ask for. Right? You don't tend to want to ask God for righteous judgment. In your case, you tend to want to ask Him for mercy. But you need to know when your life is not on track, just in the same way that the judges of Israel needed to know, so that they could reestablish their relationship with the Creator. Um, what about in verse 6? where it says, I said you are gods. Who has John, Ch John chapter 10 to read that for us? Okay, so Jesus is quoting Psalm 82 to prove what? Not a trick question. That he's the Son of God. Yeah, he's, he's using it to prove his deity. He's saying, look, you were called gods. In your law, you were called gods because you received the word of God. You're his representatives here on earth. It's a lowercase g, right? But it's still the same word. It's still the same word. Elohim just has a, a different connotation here. If Jesus is saying this as a way of proving his deity, does it change the way we view this very short psalm here? Are we not his representatives on the earth? Do we not talk about that sometimes? You're the only Bible that some people will ever read. The whole vision for, for Eastland for this year is by the end of the year that other people, when they watch us living our lives, that they see Jesus in us. We represent him. We strive to represent him. And that, that means we are gods in the same sense that they are talking about here in Psalm 82. So if that's the case, and Asaph is saying, God, we want you to come down and give your righteous judgment, on these so-called gods, then that's the same thing that could happen to us. If we're not careful. You know, we read about things like um, you know, unjust towards the fatherless and the destitute and the afflicted, and we like to think that we would never be unjust towards them. But there are a lot of ways in which we could violate the principles of God. Right? We could violate the commands that we find in His Word. And the, the point of this is, I think, that in the end, there's going to be righteousness. Any thoughts um, on Psalm 82 before we move on?
Yeah, I, that, that's a really good point. And, and not only when you see injustice, but when you see something that is to you a temptation. Ideally, you'd want to see it the way God sees it, so that you're disgusted by it, revolted by it. It's, you see it as evil rather than as pleasure. Yeah, that's a good point. Any other thoughts? All right, let's start the Messianic Psalms. We're going to go back and start in the beginning, and we'll start with Psalm 2, Coronation of the Son. Now, one thing that we need to know about... Um, Messianic Psalms, particularly David's Psalms, there's a lot of debate amongst scholars around um, is David talking directly about Christ? Is he talking directly about himself? Is it something where this is his experience and it is a reflection of Christ because he is a type of Christ? Or is he actually prophesying, etc.? Right? And I think what we'll find uh, it, as we study this psalm definitively that he is prophesying about Christ. There are some psalms that he talks about himself very clearly, and you can relate it to him, and it also relates to Christ. But there are other instances where he's talking about Christ himself and only Christ, or at least as far as we know, only Christ. Um, but just keep in mind that the apostles referred to David as a prophet, and he did, in fact, prophesy about Jesus. So with that, who has Psalm 2, 1 through 6? Okay, so concerning the nations, it talks about the nation's rage. They are trying to break free from God. And, and right away, you, you're, you're thinking the nations being kind of the Gentile nations, right? All, all of the nations of the world outside of God's chosen people, they're trying to break free from God because they don't want to submit to his rule. And they don't want to accept the anointed one. Um, and I think this should sound familiar. Who has Acts 4, 23-28? Can read that for us. Okay, so this is, I think this is a pretty big revelation here. Um, they're qu quoting from Psalm 2, and so that's how we know that David is a prophet, right? We've already talked about that. They're also, in, in their quote of Psalm 2, it says, why do the Gentiles rage? So we get a little glimpse into what the nations is all about. But if you think about the situation that they're in, particularly with Herod being involved, is it just the Gentile nations who are raging? Is it just the Gentiles who are um, trying to break free from the, the rule of the anointed one? It's not. It's the nation of Israel. So if you're an Israelite and you're, you're familiar with the scriptures, which we talked about, they would be with Psalms particularly, you're going to get to this and you're going to read this. And perhaps you read it your whole life thinking, the Gentiles are going to do this, the Gentiles are going to do this. And then all of a sudden, whoa. Where we're doing this, well, hopefully you realize that, right? Um, it's, it's like that one uh, cartoon that Reggie likes to quote, we have met the enemy and, and he is us, right? Which then should lead you to understand that, in fact, we could be the ones that are raging against God because we don't want to submit to his rule and we don't want to accept the anointed one. 
which will bring a whole different meaning to the psalm as we read it, if we realize that it can apply to us in that way. Especially when we go to the next section here, where, where the Father actually speaks. Um, he is not concerned or worried at all. In fact, he laughs at the idea that they could reject the Son. I mean, the worst that they could do was kill his body, but in, that, in fact, was exactly what needed to happen so that he could be resurrected. Um, so he laughs and holds them in derision. He speaks to them in wrath. And then in verse 6 it says, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Hill. What is the implication of that verse? Why does David use that kind of as a punctuation to this text? Nations are raging against God, and he says, finally, I've set my What was that? You know, this is this is God actually speaking in verse six. So David is David is talking about the nations raging against God. Uh, raging against his anointed one. Um, and then he says, God laughs at their attempt to reject him. And um, he holds them in derision. And then he speaks to them in wrath and terrifies them in his fury, saying, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. And so he's saying, you know, all of this effort is in vain. I have set my king on the holy hill. So the point here, the implication here, I think, is that it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter if you believe me or not, reject me or not. My plan is in action, and it will see, you know, I will see it through to fulfillment. So I have set my king on Zion as the ruler. He's talking about Christ, right? And, and he's also talking about David in that he did set David as king, but here ultimately he's talking about Christ, I think, because yeah, exactly. Correct. Correct. Yeah, there is nothing that you can do if, if every nation, if every person on the earth got together and had a single plan on how to reject God, it wouldn't matter. God's plans are not. Any other thoughts on that before we go to the second half? Okay, who has a second half for us? Okay, so in this section, it is Christ speaking. It's the anointed speaking. Um, and what does verse 7 normally remind us of? Verse 7 says, The Lord said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. What? What's that? Hebrews chapter 1. But what event do we normally think about? What's that? Baptism? Yeah, I, that's what I first thought of, right? Uh, was baptism. But it's interesting here. Um, if you look at Acts, Acts 13, God says that, that Jesus is his begotten son at the point of resurrection, which is, uh, in this case, being discussed as a promise to us that because Christ was resurrected, we will also be resurrected. Um, in Hebrews 5, it is tied to Jesus becoming the high priest. God says he's my begotten son at the point that he becomes our high priest. And when did that happen? What did Jesus have to do to become our high priest? 
and, and, then, and then be resurrected. Exactly. So those things, what's that? Correct, yeah. But it, ha, it, it was after the resurrection that he became the Holy Spirit, or the, the high priest. And then, um, back to your earlier comment, Scott, in Hebrews 1, it talks about Jesus being superior to the angels. And in that situation, God also says, he is, you are my son, today I have begotten you. When did they say that? When, when did God say that to Jesus? That he was superior to angels? It was when he sat down at the right hand of the throne, which happened after he was resurrected. So in all of these cases, we see that God is referring to Jesus as his begotten, only begotten son, at the point of resurrection. Acts 13, Hebrews 5, and Hebrews 1. Um, which should give us great comfort in knowing that because Christ was resurrected, we will also someday be resurrected. In fact, um, let me see. Let me, let me look. I'm going to look at a, a different set of notes that I have here. No, sorry, can't find it. <clears throat> so, what will he do? Um, what will Jesus do after, after his resurrection, after becoming the begotten Son? He will intercede. Yep, he'll intercede. He'll be our high priest. But what does he do to people who don't believe? What does it say in verse 9? I will break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And in Revelations 2, 12, and 19, we see all kinds of language like that. We see Jesus with a sword. We see him with a rod of iron. He is destroying his enemies. Um, and so there's a warning in that, right? And the warning that David gives, or Asaph gives us at the end of this psalm, is it Asaph or did I copy that wrong? No, it's David. David, sorry. Um, the warning that David gives us here is be wise and heed the one who rules. Serve with fear and rejoice with trembling. And what do, what do we think is the significance there of serving with fear and rejoicing with trembling? What does that, what does that seem to suggest? Hold him in awe. That's right. You've got to, it's like, I, I will worship you. I will love you. I will serve you with, always with a sense of knowing you spoke this world and everything in it into existence. And, you know, like Bill Cosby used to say, I brought you into this world. I can take you out. Right? Um, and, and that's the way we should serve God in complete and total awe and never lose sight of the, our position as it relates to him. And then he closes the psalm by saying, Blessed are all who take refuge. Uh, where else might we take refuge? In the world. Is it going to help us? No, because Jesus is going to come with a rod of iron and he's going to shatter us like, like a, a clay pot. So there's really nowhere you can go for refuge. We, begin, we began the psalm with the nations plotting against God and trying to reject God. and you know, kind of taking refuge in, in numbers, so to speak. But there's no way you can go to hide from the wrath of God, to hide from the justice of God. Um, the only place you can be safe is in him. Yeah, absolutely. Any other thoughts?
God. Yes. Yeah, no, that's a that's a really good point. I hadn't thought of that, but by the time you become hardened to God and his will, you are more susceptible to being shattered into pieces as opposed to God coming to you and maybe shaping you in a in a more pleasing direction. That's a really good point. I like that. Any other thoughts? All right. Psalm 8. O Lord, our Lord. Who has Psalm 8 for us? All right. The majesty of God. So David ascribes greatness to God's name. And uh, in fact, I, I found out that at one point, um, Jews used to actually fear, they may still, I don't know, fear pronouncing God's name. The fear was that they would use it in name and incur the wrath of God. And so they tried to avoid even pronouncing God's name. That's how much they revered it. Rhetorical question Do we have that same reverence today? You hear God's name used as, as almost a curse word, actually as a curse word by so many people in the world. They have no reverence at all for God and for his majesty. But, but David starts out by saying, O oh Lord, our Lord, which loses a little bit of meaning in English. I think probably a better translation would, would be, O oh God, uh, my master. Um, but he is calling out to, to God and, and he starts the psalm by giving him uh, majesty um, and glory above the heavens. He then talks about the insignificance of man. Um, he says that man seems unimportant among God's work. We are a speck of dust in the vastness of creation. For any of you science nerds uh, here today, like if you think about almost anything in, in nature, in creation, it's blows your mind, like the complexity of the human eye or the fact that even traveling at the speed of light, uh, it takes four hours to get a message to Earth from the moon. And, and the universe is so vast. We don't even know how big it is. We don't even know if it goes on forever or if it has an end. You know, like I've seen movies where they, they put up fake walls and they trick people into thinking they're somewhere where they're not. And then, you know, as the, as the character walks out of the scene, they walk out of the, the, the hidden walls and you realize they're actually somewhere where they, like, who knows what's at the edge of the universe. This all may be kind of like a little, I don't want to say trick, but it's a little place that God's put us in knowing that we'll never find out. But yet, in the vastness of all of that, he cares about us. He is mindful of us. Um, and my question for you this morning for discussion is, why do you think that is? Why is he mindful? Made in his image? Yeah. 
we're the pinnacle of creation. Yeah, we're the ones that are plotting against him in rage, right? Rejecting his anointed one. Yeah. Great. And the other thing about, that reminds me too, the other thing about nature is, and, and, and combining with what Phil said about being made in the image of God, we're made in the image of God. So when we try to think about how we should be behaving, how we should be living our lives, we need to be looking up, right? We need to be looking to Him for guidance. We need to go to His Word and find out what it says for us and how we should behave. But what does the world do? The world looks to the creation. They say, well, man is just an animal. We evolved from animals. And so, of course we act like this. Look at how the animals act. Right? And they try to prove or, or justify their behavior by saying we're just a higher form of animal. But we're not. We're made in God's image. Um, and so that's the irony, I think, too, in the fact that we're re rejecting nature, but yet we tend to want to turn back to it to justify our behavior. Any other thoughts on why God is mindful of us? He loves us. Yeah, He created us for a relationship. That's the whole point of our existence. Anything else? Right, and that was a plan all along, and you know, we've taken the detour from that in, in the sin in the garden, but that's still the plan, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, it's, it's, especially if it's a close relationship, you're thinking about them, like how can I help them? Exactly, that's a great point. Let's look at um, how this psalm is, is quoted in the New Testament. Um, I don't think that I, I handed out Matthew 21, um, but Matthew 21 is when uh, Jesus cleansed the temple. And it quotes Psalm 8, Out of the mouth of babes and infants you have established strength against your foes, still the enemy and the avenger. It's quoting this psalm in that context because the children who were there, who witnessed Christ cleanse the temple, were shouting out that he was the son of David. They knew and they recognized him as the son, not only the son of David, but the son of God in what he was doing there. Out of the mouth of babes and infants. It was so plain that even the children knew what was going on. And yet those who were in charge, of course, they wanted to reject him. Um, this next section, verses 4 through 6, is quoted in Hebrews 2. Who, who has Hebrews 2, 5 through 9? Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here, and we probably can't give it full justice. But in Hebrews, the Hebrew writer, which I don't know, did you all, did you all hear about the, the 
controversy on uh, Jeopardy? It was what what book in the Bible did Paul write that quoted the Old Testament the most? And the, the person who got the answer right wrote Hebrews. I'm sure Reggie liked that. Um, anyway, <laughs> sorry. The Hebrew writer <laughs> is quoting Psalm 8 to talk about who? Who's the Hebrew writer talking about in chapter 2? Jesus. If I ask a question and you don't know the answer, just say Jesus. He's talking about Jesus. That makes sense. This is a messianic psalm, right? But does it feel like the psalmist is talking about Jesus in this particular section? In, in Psalms 8. What is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? Made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. What does that mean? Who are the heavenly beings? Is it just the angels? Um, in fact, guess what word is used here? Elohim. Yeah. We said before that Elohim has been used to talk about angels before. But I think that there's a dual meaning here um, that, that is pretty fascinating in that I believe that in Psalm 8 it's talking about us and it's talking about Jesus. We were made a little lower than the heavenly beings, and we were given dominion over this earth. We were made in God's image, which gives us glory and honor and majesty, but we're lower than he is. and We have been given dominion over the earth. The same thing is true of Jesus. He came to the earth to live as a man, and he was given dominion over everything. And so, let's see, where is it? Uh, God has given us dominion on the earth and rule in the heavenly places. He has raised us up together and made us to sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It says that in Ephesians 2. Um, it also says that um, Christ was given the throne upon which to rule until every enemy is destroyed. You see, we are in that likeness, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. A few verses down in Hebrews. So we're not ashamed to be called brethren of Jesus because he was lower than the angels. We are lower than the angels. He was given dominion. We're given dominion. He was resurrected. We will be resurrected. So there's a lot wrapped up into this. It's not just simply prophesying about Jesus and who he is so that we will recognize him. It's also, I think, teaching us that we receive blessings through him um, and that we, you know, he is sort of, the one that we look to and whom our, all of our hope comes through. Um, I had another point that I was going to make and I've lost it. Anybody? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. The way the, the Jews tended to interpret Scripture is that it had meaning in whatever context it was being studied in, right? Yeah. So one meeting when it was written and maybe other, multiple other meetings as time went on, yeah. Right. Any other thoughts?
Yeah, no, that's 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 an excellent point. Um, and, and it also reminds me too, um, you know, when you think about Jesus being um, tempted by Satan in the wilderness, what does Satan promise Jesus? All the kingdoms of the earth. What did Jesus ultimately end up having dominion over? All kings of the earth, everything, over everything. Satan was actually offering him a shortcut to what he was promised in the first place. Hey, I can give this to you now and you don't have to suffer for it. But he chose the suffering part so that he could be perfected and rise to a higher level of majesty. And then, and to Matt's point, that, that means that we too will rise to that level once, once he comes again. Um, okay, so I was hoping to get to the next song, but I don't think we'll have time. Uh, thanks for your participation.